what I was thinking. It was work harder. I was like, I got to work harder than any other writer a lot. And, that's and what did that work look like, like to you? Just always writing and like always not being satisfied and, and being a, a real critic of my work and mm -hmm. trying to make it better and trying to be more, try to get it to sound more interesting and figure out what my sentences were and yeah. letting myself be bad and repeat myself until I got better. Like, so I don't, I don't think, um, and I don't think that I ever let that go. Like, it, I don't, I don't, I'm not sitting here today saying I work harder than any other writer alive, but I do remember having that, that, that feeling when I was young, like, that's what I need to do. That's the only way to do You're listening to What the Hell is Michael Jammin Talking About? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about creativity, I'm talking about writing, and I'm talking about reinventing yourself through the arts. What the hell is Michael Jammin talking about today? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about, uh, honestly, one of the greatest, I feel one of the greatest writers of my generation. Uh, her, yep, yep. Her name is Sheila Hetty. She is the author of, I guess, 11 books, including uh, Pure Color, although it's spelled with a U, the Canadian way. Uh, a Garden of Creatures, Motherhood, How Should a Person Be, and her forthcoming book, uh, Alphabetical Diaries. And she's just an amazing talent. I would, so she's an author, but I wouldn't, I don't describe her this way. And by the way, I'm going to talk about Sheila for about 59 minutes. And then at the end, I'll let her get a word in, and then I'll probably cut her off. But I have to give her a good uh, proper introduction because she's really that, uh, really that amazing of a writer. So author isn't really the right word. She really is, in my opinion, an artist who paints with words. And if you were to, if you imagine going up to a Van Gogh painting, standing right up next to it, uh, and then you see all these brush strokes, and then you take a step back, and you're like, okay, now I see uh, the patterns of the brush strokes. And you take a little step back, you, oh, and the patterns form an image. And then another step back, you say, oh, that's a landscape. It really is like that with her writing. She has these images that she paints with words, and then they form bigger thoughts, and you pull back and it's really, it's really amazing what she does and how she kind of reinvents herself with each piece. And so I'm so excited and honored, Sheila, for you to join me here so I can really talk more about this with you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks. That introduction made me so happy. Thank you for oh, saying all that. It's, let me tell you how I first, by the way, how I first uh, discovered you. So I have a daughter, Lola. She's, she's 20. She's a writer. And uh, so we trade, you know, I write something, we trade. It's really lovely that we get to talk about. And so she's off at school, but she left a book behind. And I'm like, all right, I'll, what's this book she left behind? Because that way I can read it. We can talk about that. We have our, I say we, are, we have our, our book club. And she left Pure Color. And I was like, oh, I, don't like the, I like the cover. So I'll take a look at it. And what I didn't realize, it was the perfect book to, to discover you by, because it's a book about, among other things, about a father's uh, relationship with his daughter. And... Uh, so I, I text her. I say, I'm, I'm reading Pure Color. She goes, oh, Sheila Hetty is one of my favorite authors. If I could write like anybody, it would be her. I'm like, all right, well, I got to continue reading this. And then a couple of days later, I get to the part. I send her a text. I say, you and me would make a great leaf. And she goes, oh, that's my favorite part. The tree, that's my favorite part. And so I had, so my, and oh, you're also an interviewer. You've interviewed some amazing, amazing writers, uh, Joan Didion, Margaret Atwood, you know, big, Big shots. And so I'm sure as an interviewer, you give a lot of thought to your first question. So I was trying to go, oh, I better give a lot of thought to my first question. And um, I kept coming back to the same one, which is pure color. It's such a it's such a big swing. Like if you were to pitch me this idea, you'd say, I'm, I'm going to do I'm going to write a book. It's about a father's relationship with his daughter, but it's also about a, a woman's unrequited love with her friend. But it's also about the soul and what it means to have a have a life. If you, I'd say, I don't know, Sheila. That's a kind of a big swing. I don't know about this. And but you hit it out of the park, like you did it, like it was beautifully done. And so my first question is, you come up with an idea like this. Where do you, where do you get the nerve to think that you can actually pull this off? This is uh, really <laughs> like, where do you get the nerve to think that? Okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. The nerve. Well, it's like it's such a hard, it's such a big swing. It's like, how do you know you can do this? Do you know what well, I'm saying? Yeah, it's I don't know. I mean, um, you know, I I don't know that I could do it. So it's nice to hear. I mean, I don't think that um, 
I don't think that you ever think you're going to be able to finish the book that you start, you know, like whenever I, and, and then when you finish a book, you never think you're ever going to start a new one. That's sort of where I am right now, like in that confused place. So it, I, it, there's a part of it that always feels like, um, um, like it, um, it, it could ease, it could, I, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, I don't know how to answer that question. It's a weird, it's a weird process. There's no process. You know, there's no, there's no system to doing it. And then you hope you, you did it. You feel good and it, it feels done, but you don't know how you ever got there. And do, how do you know, how do you know you arrived? Like, how do you know w- when it's time to quit on something? And do you ever quit on something? Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot. Um, but usually not, not like three or four years in, usually like 60 pages in or something like that. It's, and what pages is when you start thinking like, this is not working. How do you, is it a gut feeling? What do you, what do you, how do you know? Your curiosity runs out. Your curiosity runs out. Okay. So you get bored by it yourself. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It's just like that, that was fun. That was nice. That was a good couple of weeks. I was really excited. I really thought this was going somewhere and then it's just done. It just ends. It's like a relationship. Like a, you think, oh, this is so great. I'm going to be with this person. And then, you know, after six months, you're like, ah, this wasn't, I was, I was kidding myself. Yeah. it's but it's so you're writing. I have so much I want to say. It, it seems like you reinvent yourself with each piece. It's like you're not. You know what I'm saying? It's like pure color is very very different from how should a person be. Which I was like, okay, I want to read this because I'm not sure how should a person be. Which is extremely different from alphabetical diaries, which was is almost like an experiment. And I wonder, like, do you get do you get pushback from your from your agent or your publisher? Like, do they want you to do the same thing? Cause we know it works. No, I think that at this point, there's no expectation of that. I, when I wrote my second book, there was a feeling like that's not like the first one. And there was some disappointment and the publisher said, uh-huh. this book doesn't count, you know, as your next book in part, I think, cause it was so different. But I think at this point, you know, that's not, I mean, I've been publishing for 20 years. That's not really what people say to me anymore. Really? What do they say? They, they say, oh, good, this is fresh and no. it's, it's more from you? No, I mean, I guess I've, I have I change publishers a lot more than other people do. So, mm-hmm. you know, my, my publisher of uh, Motherhood didn't like Pure Color, so they rejected it. So really? I found a different publisher. So, you know, and the, the publisher of Tickner, my second book, didn't like How Should a Person Be? So I found a different publisher. So I think I move around a lot for that reason. Do you think, is that common with, with authors? You have to tell me all about no. this author thing. No, no it's, it's not. not. Really common. <laughs> no, usually you have like one publisher and one editor and you just stick with them for a long time. So it seems so you came up, you came through the art. It seems, all right. I have, I have this idea of who you are from reading your books. Cause you have, it's all very personal what you write and uh, it, which makes it brave. It's brave for a couple of reasons. It's brave because you're being so vulnerable you know, you're putting yourself out there, but it's also brave because I feel like you're trying something new each time and like that could fail. And, you know, so that to me is what's so is part of what makes your, your writing so exciting. But uh, do you have any expectation? Like when you, when you, when you're writing something, which is so different, do you have an expectation of what your reader, how, how you want them to react? I mean, I want them to get to the end of the book. That's what I want. Like I want to draw them through but I don't think I have a feeling like, oh, I want them to be sad on this page and I want them to be, you know, curious on this page and feel this way on this page. I just want them to be interested enough to get to the end. So right. how do I keep that momentum up and how do I, you know, I'm, I'm not some, you know, some people in conversation, they have long monologues, you know, they're like a monologuer, but I'm not because I'm always afraid people are going to lose interest. So I kind of feel like the same with my book. Like I'm always afraid that somebody's going to lose interest. So I'm always right. trying to keep it moving. But it's not it's not an emotional reaction. You're, you're, I mean, your writing is very philosophical. I, to me, like when I'm reading your work, I feel like maybe what this is my theory about what you have, and I'm sure it's not right. But it's that <laughs> there are, there are passages which I feel are so rich and so smart, and I have so much thought that I I have to go back and read it again. So I'm wondering if that's what you're thinking. Like I want to write something that makes people have to read it again. No, I never think that because I'm a very fast reader and I don't reread passages and I don't read slowly. So for me, I'm always thinking that people are reading. I'm always imagining the person reading kind of fast. 
Um, but you're th- really, cause your thought, I mean, some of them are like really, some of your thoughts are very deep and very profound. And I'm like, I'm not sure if I understood all this. I gotta, I gotta read it again. <laughs> I mean, don't you think? No. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I don't really think about that. I don't really think about the person, the the reader in that way of like, are they going to have to read this again? Is this going to be hard for them to understand? Cause I think my language is very straightforward. It so is. Yeah. I don't know how I think about the reader. I think I think of myself as the reader, you know? So I'm just, I'm really writing it so that I like every sentence. I like the way it, it turns. I like the pictures it makes. Mm-hmm. And, but when you say, I, I want them to get to the end, what, do you, what are you hoping they'll do at the end? Is there, any, is there any hope or expectation? Well, I think like, especially in pure color, the end is really important. Like it kind of makes the whole book make sense. Yes. Yeah. And motherhood too. And maybe less how should a person be in less alphabetical diaries. But I, I think in some cases a book, I'm somebody who doesn't always read books to the end. You know, I like, I like getting a taste of different authors' minds and so on. But I, I think in, in the case of some books, you have to read it to the end to really understand the whole. So that's in the case of pure color, why I wanted people to get to the end. Because right. it, it makes the beginning mean something different. If you've read it does. End. It's, I mean, it is, and it's about, it's about processing grief. And did you, so do you outline when you come up with an idea, where do you begin? Well, with Pure Color, I thought I want to write a book about the history of art criticism. So I, I always start off really far away from where I end up. I yeah. always think that I want to write a book of nonfiction, and I'm not a good nonfiction writer, so it always ends up being a novel. But I, I think I usually start off with an – well, in the case of this book, I also started off with this title that I had in my dream. The title was Critics Bear, B-A-R-E. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking about art criticism and so on, but then I don't know. The books kind of take on their own direction. Um, I never really understood when people said that they had characters that sort of did things that they didn't expect, but I feel like that is true sometimes of the book as a whole. Like it moves in a direction I didn't expect. So well, no, and I, I couldn't outline. You don't outline at all. And so no. you, do you discover, do, you, do you, does it require you to discover what the story is? And then once you find it, like toss out the stuff that's not the story or. Yeah. I basically write way too much and then just cut and try to find the story and move things in different orders and, and, and try to find the plot after I've written a ton of stuff already. Because you are, because I know from reading you, like you come from the art world, you're, you know, you're an artist and you hang out, I think you hang out with artist people and so you talk about what art is. Is that right? And so, or no, I mean, I, mean, I have a, don't, don't do not shatter <laughs> what I think of you. What, no, that's not it. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, and relationships and all that kind of relation. Oh, and relationships. Because I I mean, I don't know. It seems like that's why I say you're an artist because you're, you have these conversations even about what art is and, and do you, do you draw inspiration from, from paintings or when you approach? Yeah. I'm interested in the book as a, as art, I think more than storytelling. Like I'm interested in Uh the book as, yeah, as the, the, as, um, as sort of an, experience that you're undergoing in different way from just the experience of being told a story. Right. I don't think that um, I'm so interested probably in the things that a lot of other novelists are interested in, like character and plot and conflict and all those things. Well, it's really, I mean, it, it's, I, I've heard you say this, it's really, you're writing various forms of you uh, and it's very personal and, and very intimate, but you also made the distinction in something I read where there's Sheila, the author, then there's Sheila, the character. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, in two of the books, there's kind of a character that sort of stands in in a way for me, but um, but it never really, it doesn't feel like a direct transcription of myself or my life or my thoughts. Like there's always this feeling of sort of, maybe it's like how a- actors are. Like there's a part of yourself that goes into the character and there's other mm-hmm. parts of yourself that are left out, you know? And so, right. And so I was going to say, so what, what is it? Is there stuff about you that you leave out? Like, for example, I mean, you know, how should a person be or, or alphabetical diaries? It feels like we're talking about you, right? Yeah. Well, how should a person be felt a lot like a character, like pretty self-consciously. Like I was thinking about Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan. This was like 2005 and, and, and um, Britney Spears and like these kind of women in culture that were like bad girls and doing things, you know, <clears throat> sort of the subject of so much attention and so narcissistic or mm-hmm. considered narcissistic. And I was sort of, and The Hills, which was a show that I really loved, and sort of thinking about this character in the book being a voice that was somewhere between me and those girls. Like, so there was this, um, yeah, this layering on of 
of personalities, which I'm not like thinking about what does it mean to try to be a celebrity? What does it mean to be want to be looked at, to idolize oneself with the diaries? Those are my diaries. So there wasn't like a sense of a character in the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, But because there's no, because the sentences are separated from one another, I guess it's like, I don't feel like I'm telling anybody anything about my life because there's no, there's no anecdote in there. But I see that's the thing. And we'll just talk about alphabetical diaries because you're telling with such an, let me tell people what it is. So it's basically an ordinary diary is chronological. It's, you know, this is what I did today and this is tomorrow, whatever. Um, But you, you grouped your diary by the first letter of each sentence which organize and and this is again another high degree of difficulty because this could have easily been gimmicky but it was not it was a really it was a rethinking of what a diary is and so and 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 when i say patterns emerge so for example when you get to d d's was do not do not whatever or do this or that and so you hear okay so here's a person creating rules for themselves and then in e it was even though so now they're creating rules but creating exceptions for these rules like making ex- allowances and and, and so what you have is, and what's so interesting about it, many of these thoughts were contradictory. So you're painting a picture of this person, but in one sentence, okay, maybe she's dating this guy. And the next sentence is the other guy. And like, well, who's, what's going on here? Then I realized, oh, it's, this is not chronological. And so I'm getting a complete picture of this person, which is so interesting. But so I know who, I guess, I kind of, I kind of know who you are, but I don't know who you, you are today. I know who you are as a this arching thing in in your life, which is so freaking interesting, and th- was that what you were that was where your the genesis, your, your the thought process going into this? Yeah, I mean, it was it's so it's like ten years of diaries, and yeah, I put it into Excel and like the, the A to Z function, so it's completely alphabetical, first letter of the sentence, and then the second letter and the third letter, and you know, it was just, um, I mean, I guess I wanted to see exactly that, like what are like what happens if you look at yourself in that way? Like, do you see patterns? Mm-hmm. Do you understand yourself in a different way? Not narratively, but as a as a collection of themes or as um yeah, exactly that. Like a sort of like a scientific or sort of a cross section of yourself. Yeah. Was, yeah. And and it worked that way, like because I think with the diaries, what you do see is oh, there are sort of these recurring thoughts and these recurring themes and these recurring ways of perceiving the world and perceiving yourself that that persists over 10 years that that actually the oneself you know you think of yourself as this thing that's constantly changing through time and especially a diary gives you that feeling but then when you do it alphabetical the 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 self looks like a really static kind of thing in some way like no I'm actually just these few little bubbles of concerns that that don't change that keep recurring right it's so that's why when you know when people by the way when people say everything's been done before everything's been written it's like well that's because you haven't read sheila hetty start reading her she this is different this is that's what's so interesting about uh, that's why i think you're such an amazing writer and it totally worked it's totally you get a picture of this person and the recurring themes and recurring worries and uh yeah and it, even what like one of them some things that struck me there was one passage where it's like you go into a bookstore and you're like but isn't this also novels isn't it also unimportant and i'm like no, if it was, you wouldn't be doing this. Like, so this was just a, a thought that you had at one at point. It's not how you feel. It's how you felt at this one moment, right? Yeah, yeah. Literary fiction, yeah. Like, what a little tiny thing that is. Yeah. Um, it but... Is, but, but, but when people, okay, so now we have this picture of you, and when you go do, let's say, book signings or whatever, and people come up to you, they must have a para social relationship with you where they feel they know you because you're, your writing is so intimate and what's your what's your response to that i think that's nice i mean i think that that's kind of the feeling you want people to have is because it is your soul or your mind or whatever that you're trying to give people and so if somebody feels that they know you well in a certain sense they do you know i mean obviously not not the well, they know what you what... share, but there's, okay, I don't know what kind of yeah. music you like. I've read all this stuff. I, I, I know your insecurities and fears, but I don't know what, I don't know, you know, what you think is funny. I don't know what you, music you like, you know, there's stuff you held back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I think, I think that's like, 
I don't know. I mean, I don't know. People aren't really very weird with me at books or things like that. People are just like pretty nice. And, 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 uh-huh. and I never get this. I really have gotten, have, I've really had interactions that feel creepy or weird or presumptuous or any right. of those things. Well, it's not even, I'm not even going even that far, but they feel like they must feel like they know you, but they certainly, but they know what you share. They know as much as you share. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah these kind of brave, bold decisions you make to create all this stuff. Is there a writer whose work you emulated in the beginning? Like, where do you come, where do you begin to come up with this stuff? Was there someone who you wanted to write just like? I mean, I really loved Dostoevsky and Kafka and um, the heavy Beckett. hitters. Yeah, I mean, I just right. loved all the, all the greatest writers. But um, did you want to write like them? No, I mean, I think the closest I ever felt like I wanted to write like a writer was, do you know Jane Bowles? B-O-W-L-E-S? No. She was married to Paul Bowles. He's no, to, to me, much of your work felt a little bit like Italo Calvino's, uh, some of it work. Some of it was very ethereal and, and meditative. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Jane Bowles was like the, and, and was the only one that I really felt myself like imitating her sentences. She wrote a book called Two Serious Ladies, which I still really love. That was the only time when I felt like I was falling into somebody else's cadences and rhythms and so on. And what happened um, when you, when that? And then you... that was with my first book, The Middle Stories. And then the second book was written, was so different. I was, that, that, yeah, the second book I wrote was in such a different style that, that kind of, that left me. But maybe there's still a way in which I still do. I mean, I think she's probably the writer that I write the most like, if anyone. But uh-huh. I mean, her, she only wrote one book. So it's a very different kind of um, life than the, the one that I've had. No, That's, I'm just always just trying to keep myself interested, you know? So I think that I, I don't ever want to, I, I have a very, um, I just, I just want it to be fun for me, you know? And so like, if I was you. to write the same book again, it wouldn't be fun. And I'm, books take like five years to write or this diary's book took like more than 10 years to edit. So by the time I'm done a book, there's no, I'm such a different person than the book. Yeah, was in some way when I started, even though I just said that every, you don't really change, but there's a way in which you kind of get tired of like thinking about the same things. Over but and over. then it, you think it would be hard to not comp- constantly tinker with it as you, you know, isn't that part of the problem? I, I like constantly t- tinkering with it. That's that's fun. But then you have to let go. But, but you know, how yeah. do you let go of it, though? Well, at a, at a certain point, you start making it worse. Like you're like, oh, I right. think I'm starting to make it worse because you start to become self-conscious and then you start to want to correct it. And then you start to want it to sort of be like the person that you are today rather than the person you were five right. years ago. But you've got to like honor the person that was five years ago that started the book. So you can't carry it on so far that you become, you've changed so much that now you're a critic of the book that's going to destroy the book. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because that's uh, something I, I think about quite a bit. Uh, yeah, like how do I just let, let it go in the, someone else you know it's funny when you talk about the the language you because that's one thing that struck me about pure color your sentence your sentences are written in very uh uh, it's not very they're very it's kind of brief it's very uh i don't know what the best way to describe it but it's 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 almost terse and to be honest if you had told like as i'm reading this i could have thought this was said 150 years ago then occasionally you say you, know, you make a reference to something modern like Google or, and I'm like, Oh, wait a minute, this takes place today. Um, I mean, so that was a conscious, obviously decision that you made to kind of give it a timelessness. Yeah. I kind I always kind of want that because I think that I, <clears throat> I, I think that's my hope for a book is that it could be understood in a hundred years or 500 years or, you know, yeah. you read Plato today. Like you want to write something that people could understand in a thousand years. Yeah. But, 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 but you know what I'm saying? Like the language, it just felt, it almost felt, yeah. Cause it, but that your language is different though in, in some, you know, an alphabetical diary is well, obviously since it's a diary, but uh, man, I mean, I, I, so to me, it's like, you're not doing, like I said, you're not doing the same thing. It's like, if, I don't know, it, it could have been two different authors. That's what I'm saying. I guess it felt mm-hmm. like two very different pieces and it was just wonderful. Um, yeah. But when you say, well, so what then, because like I said, you you have these art friends. I have this whole life for you. You have these, <laughs> these because you went to art, you know, you studied art, and you hang out with a bunch of artists and you talk about art. And I want to know what these conversations are. Because I don't, I don't, we don't talk about art in TV writing. We, no one, <laughs> we don't think we're doing art, you know, but right. I feel like that's what you guys are doing. And so do what is the perp? Do you talk about what the whole point of art is? Um, I mean, I think I did when I was younger. 
Um, right. Then you grow out of when it. When I was in my twenties. Yeah. And then uh-huh. you kind of figure that out for yourself in some way. Well, then you come, then you have your, you know, crises and whatever, and then you got to think about it and talk about it again. But no, I think these days what I talk about with my friends is just like whatever the specific project is, whatever problems you're having with a specific thing, mostly complaining, like the difficulty of not being able to, to pull it off or feeling like you, you're stuck or you're never going to be able to write it. I have this these three other writers that I share my work with, mm-hmm. um, we're meeting tomorrow. So I just, before I got on the call with you, I just sent something off to them and, you know, tomorrow we're just going to like have read each other's things and talk about our, you know, how, how, how we feel about it. But for me, I'm just like, I think what I need at this point from them is a reassurance, honestly. <laughs> reassurance. Because, yeah. Yeah. Because you're so lost in the middle and you just don't, you don't know what you're communicating and if you're communicating anything and is it worth continuing? It, should it just all be thrown out? Like there's so much doubt. So, it's so because it's like, it's so very, uh, it's so very humble of you because you're very, uh, you're a master writer and yet you're, you, you make it sound like you're still a student. You know what I'm saying? But you're you kind of always, I mean, don't you, don't you think, I don't know if it's the same for you, but don't you think you're always kind of a student because Whenever you start, yeah, yeah, I, I always, look, yes, when every time you look at that blind fish, I don't know, how, I don't know how to do any of this. But, yeah, exactly. Um, you always feel like you're like back at square one somehow. Yeah. Although yeah. now, not exactly square one, because I've been starting writing this new book this week. And, you know, again, it may, it may go get to 60 pages and fall away from me. But I, I now I have a different feeling that I had, you know, when I was in my early 20s, the feeling I have now is like, oh, I did that. Oh, I've had that thought before. Oh, I've written sentences in that way before. Like I, what I'm trying to do now is none of the things that I've already done because they just, and so, yeah, where is this part of myself that I haven't written from yet? So that's kind of yeah. where I am now. So right. it's not really is, starting from square one, but it's still just as hard. So you've, right. Cause you feel like you've said everything you had to say or have done everything you wanted. To, is that what it is? Or I know what my sentences sound like. So I, I feel like, oh, I'm not surprised by that. The, that sentence, like that sounds like a sentence that my, my that's it's I feel like I'm in a you you get this rhythm that that is very pleasurable to write in yeah. the sentences have a rhythm and then but now I'm just like I'm tired of that rhythm like that rhythm can only give me one kind of sentence or one kind of thought so I'm I'm trying to figure out yeah how what else is there inside yeah yeah I I, I imagine that's hard for someone who basically you know you're a musician who's made a hit and another hit and what what if I don't do it again I mean, how do I do it differently or how do I reinvent myself No. And even just like, what's, what's the meaning in this for me now? Like with every book, there's a different phase of life you're at. And like, I'm 46 now. So I don't know how old you are. How dare you? I'm 53. <laughs> 53. Yeah. I figured yeah. you're just a few years older than me. So it's a very different age to write from because you're, you're not like, hungry in the same way you were when yeah. you were 23 and yeah you know you were both in houses like you have certain accomplished certain things and so so what is the what's the deepest part of yourself that still needs to do this you know whereas when you're 23 like there's so every part of yourself needs to do it in this extreme way like you've got to make a life for yourself you've got to prove to yourself you can do it you've got to make money you've got to, all this kind of stuff so yeah. So like, what's the place at 46 or 53 that you're writing from that is just as like vital and urgent as that place at 23? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's I, actually, that's why I started changing mediums. Cause like, I, I've kind of done this sitcom thing. Right. Uh, what what well, else, what else can I do? You know? So the essay, um, the yeah. podcast. Well, most of the essays, I, the, the essay started the whole thing. It was like, you know, cause I was, it it's funny we, in your in your book or a couple times you mentioned should I go to L A and I'm thinking why does she want to go to L A what what, <laughs> what was that about what's that um, about I've got family there when I was a little oh. kid my parents used to put me on a plane I was like five years old and I'd go to I'd be sent to L A and my I had like relatives and I would stay with them and it was just to me it's like such happy childhood memories and I just oh. love Los Angeles like I just oh. whenever I go back I think this is this is a place in the world besides Toronto that I'd most like to live really so yeah, different I just love it yeah it's so the, I love everything. I love it. Oh my god! I don't think, like, yeah. What I've been? What I've been to Toronto. I had a. Well, then I, I remember was, that LA is in America, and then I'm like, no, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> good point. We got. Um, but uh, oh, I, so there's something else. I never. I remember what I wanted to. What I want to say. Um, you have one 
in one book you're it was like you're lamenting like i hope i never have to teach and 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 now you're teaching right and yeah just for this one year what okay what was that what was that about a decision mm, well i love teaching and i i wanted the money because i didn't want to have to feel like i had to rush to start a new book so i just wanted like a year where i didn't have to have that anxiety of like what's my next book going to be like I've got to start really? and I've got to get a certain ways in and then sell it. I just, and I like teaching a lot and I just felt excited about the idea, but it was supposed to be a two-year position. And now I've just changed it to a one-year position because I, it's too, it, it becomes too much. Even one day yeah. of teaching a week is like, there's really, no time to write. Because you have to read all the, whatever they write on the, on the side, you're saying. Well, I've got to commute two hours to get there and then two hours home. And then um, I don't know. And then your brain just sort of like stays in that university space like with your students all for three or four days and then you have two days where you're not with them and then you go back to school and so what does your okay so what does your life what does your life really look like your writing life what is it okay what is it like to be an author <laughs> like on a day-to-day -day -day basis life is like like all day long you're either like writing emails or you're writing writing probably spend more time writing emails and doing correspondence mm -hmm. and businessy stuff than writing writing uh -huh. and then you know all the life stuff um, walking the dog, doing household chores. It's yeah. not very, um, I don't have a very regimented existence. Um, but I love, I just like sitting in bed and being on my computer. That's sort of my favorite. That's thing. where you write yeah, yeah. on your, on your on laptop. Oh my God, yeah. that's good. my back would kill me. But <laughs> something else you said, and I, cause I'm, I really was turning to you for answers as I was reading it. I'm like, she, she under, she's got the answers. And you said, <laughs> And you're like, I don't have the answers. But no, I'm like, no, she's got the answers. And you said art must have, at one point, art must have humor. I think you said that in How Should a Person Be? Like, art, And I was like, really? That's what you guys think? There has to be humor in art? Oh, yeah. You got to know where the funny is. Yeah. I think what? So. what? Yeah, sure. Well, you I don't understand. So I read your no. essay. It was very funny. Oh, yeah. But th thank you. But I don't, I, that, I have an intention. I have an intention when I write. But like, I don't understand why you think there has to be humor like I don't some all right. I don't, why do you think there has to be humor in it in in art? Or, because it's because humor is such a part of life. I mean, if you don't have humor in life or art, you're missing a huge part of the picture. I mean, it's all kind of it's just the absurdity of being a human. It's but you see the thing as a sitcom writer, you know, we kind of look. I'm, I'm grateful to have made a living as a sitcom writer. I, you know, it's what I wanted to do. But it's not like anyone looks at what we do is like, oh, that's high art. Or, you know, like. They go, it's kind of a, it, it, mostly they, people think it's kind of base. And I think, and when you think about, like, even at the Oscars, when they're fetting the best picture, it's never a comedy. It's always, it's that the comedies are not important enough, right? And right. so that's why I've, I had this feeling like, well, there, can humor be an art? Because I don't, can it be, you know? I mean, I think great art always has humor in it i mean I, I but it's the same thing in literature the funny writers are not as respected as right. the serious ones but i think that they're wrong i mean like kurt vonnegut i love kurt vonnegut he's extremely right. funny but he does he's never had the same status as somebody like i don't know don delillo or whatever because right he's not serious enough but i i think it's a very un, those are who are those people the people that are making that judgment that the, the 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 solemn writers that have no humor are the best writers they're idiots i mean it's you know there it's just it's not it's not the case well because i i was i was uh i gave a man my manuscript to one publisher i was rejected from him and he, he wrote he was very kind he goes oh this book really works i like it uh but uh, it's not high literature and we do high literature here and i was like how dare you but i was like well not only i i totally agree it's not high literature i didn't not that i could write high literature but i i, I didn't set out to do but but there was still that that sting of like you know you know what you're doing is not important, it's not important you know because yeah. you because it's funny yeah um, that's a stupid editor uh well you know he got the last laugh <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute <laughs> wait a minute <laughs> but um but yeah i i don't know so you okay so but is humor in in painting and humor in all art i mean yeah levity well just that scent that aspect of life that is the laugh like that is that that is the that bubbling up laughing the yeah i mean 
I think that that's joy, you know, like joy and humor are very closely connected and like a work of art without humor is like a work of art without joy. And but then what is to take that in? Then what is art? Like I, I, I'm, I'm honest here. You learned this when you're 20 and I haven't learned it yet. So what is art? to you like and what's uh, what's the difference between good art and bad art it's a reflection of the human experience it's like an expression of what it feels like to be a human that a human is making for another human okay so it's this interpretation of what you feel it is what it means to be human is that right it's an expression of what you feel like it means to be human right okay and then it's how like do you get in an object and then how do you know if it's good art or bad art i mean there's no there's no um, consensus, right? Like you liked pure color, but a lot of people don't. There's just no consensus. It because you it touched you, but it, somebody else thinks it's the worst book they've ever read, and that's okay. I mean, I think that that's right. Like we don't, we can't all speak to each other. We're not all here for all of each other. It was so. Oh, just because you mentioned that, it was so touching. Because there's there's this one moment. It, it really hit me. It was like where you explain how you felt the father, how he put, how his love for his daughter was so much that it put pressure on her not to have her life because it, her life was so important to him. And I think, oh crap, I hope I'm not doing that because I, my, my, my feelings, no, it's just pure love. It's an expression of pure love. But from the other, the other side, I can, I can see that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, and I think that that's what I was thinking about in that book. Like, that's the sort of the tragedy of like, yes, families and 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 friendships and so on that we want to love each other, but we can't and we can't in the way that we want to. Hey, it's Michael Jammin. If you like my content, and I know you do because you're listening to me, I will email it to you for free. Just join my watch list. Every Friday, I send out my top three videos of the week. These are for writers, actors, creative types, people like you. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I'm not going to spam you. And the price is free. You got no excuse. To join, go to michaeljammin.com slash watchlist. And now back to what the hell is Michael Jammin talking about? It was just so beautiful to express that as two souls stuck in a leaf. Like, you know, oh my, and... And and then like where and where is this coming from, you know? It was, uh, it felt completely um, appropriate, but also almost out of the blue, you know. And that's what was so amazing about that whole section, you know. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, but, I I I don't even remember where that idea came to me. Like I I often just I don't know if you feel like this with your writing, but like sometimes you remember exactly where an idea came from. You can even picture yourself being right there having it, and sometimes you have you almost have like an amnesia around it. Uh -huh. really and what about the part this is so many good so there was so many lovely moments of this <laughs> this woman working in a, a, a lamp store and she has to turn the lamps on like every single lamp on and it's almost like oh, yeah, i gotta do this and then but there's a, her counterpart who has to turn the lamps off at the end of the day something equally <laughs> <laughs> something equally horrible and <laughs> it was really funny and it was just um i don't know did you ever work in a lamp store no, no. I, but there was this lamp store that I used to pass on the way to one of my first jobs. And I would look in the window and, and I did eventually buy a, a lamp from that store with like all the money I had in the world. So, but I never worked in a lamp store, but I was uh -huh. obsessed with this lamp. I really thought it was going to change my life. And and do you still have it? No, it got broken in a, in a, in a fit in a of rage. Yeah, it got broken <laughs> <Okay>. in a rage. <laughs> I was stuck no. on a paragraph I put against the, this important lamp. There was a box on the floor and somebody stepped on it. And anyway, it's sad, but whatever. But okay, but all right. That, I, I, there, it, so much of it felt like, yeah. Okay, so it was, it was a version of you that wasn't exactly. Uh, but what, wait, what was your, where was this coming from? You said, is there, you had a point you were making. I don't remember. Just what, some parts you remember where oh, they came from and some parts you just. You just kind of pull out of. Pull yeah, out of you don't remember how they came about. Uh huh. Yeah. I don't know. I always feel like when I'm writing, if it, if there's an idea that has a strong emotional reaction, then I go, okay, maybe there's something there, you know, a, a strong emotional reaction in you. Yeah. In me, yeah. if it's a man, if it's a, I have a terrible memory, but if I remember something, why do I remember it? There must be a reason, you know, I like you have a terrible memory too, but, and you, you wouldn't know it, but I guess you document everything in your diary. 
I mean, the diary is like usually not about things that happened. It's more about the feelings that I'm having in the moment that I'm writing it. I wish that my diary was more about things that happened. Really? And do you, well, you get to decide what you put in your diary. I know. I know. <laughs> usually when one, one writes a diary, it's because you're in a moment of like high emotion that you need to get your feelings out. Do you write every day in your diary? No, no, no. no. Just when I need to. And I don't you... even really do it anymore now. Interesting. Yeah, there is, there is, um, there's something else you said about it. Yeah, there's so many moments that were so interesting. Like you said at one point that you, that the men you date don't understand you. I'm like, well, don't they read your book? I mean, wh why don't you just give them your book? <laughs> and they'd understand you. No, I mean, I don't know. You don't know. We'll get <laughs> I mean, back I don't to even it. think that it's really all. Yeah, like you were saying earlier, like it's not all, it's not really you. It's just like you... an expression of a corner of you. Yeah, I so yeah, I don't know, but is, you really feel that? I mean, I can't. I'm going back and forth. You'll see, I contradict myself. But there's so it's what you write is so. It to me it feels so personal. I don't know how it cannot be you. I mean, I don't know. Like when I'm working on it, it doesn't feel like me. It just feels like writing on a page. Like it feels very plastic. I don't feel like it's me. So there's no, wow, because there's no inhibition there. There's because it's very no. intimate. There's no inhibition. You no, don't feel I you'll don't be judged. Feel... This no. is just a character named Sheila, by the way. I mean, I just don't think about it. It's just, I have this, like, I just, that part of my brain is not awake when I'm editing or writing. Like, wow. That, that people are going to think it's me or whatever. Well, that's that's bold. That really is bold. Because like, yeah. the, the, the notion that you, you're not worried about being judged, you're not worrying about, you know, expressing no, I mean, yourself. I, I worry about being judged for an email that I send that's like a stupid email, like m much more than I ever worry about a book. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah, because your book is permanent and it's your art. Yeah, but I have so much control over it. Like I have so much. It, I take so much time with it. Like it's not spontaneous. It's like really thought thought through. So I'm not, and it's art. Like it's not me. Like an email is me. Like a work a, a book is not. It's its own thing. <laughs> yeah, but we well, okay. How should a person be? I mean, this to me felt like this is your struggle. It was really interesting. It was when I mean, it was a narrative struggle about a, a woman trying to find herself in a brief period of time. And I felt like, no, this is you, you know, right? I mean, it didn't, it doesn't really feel like that. No. All right. This interview's over. I I, I, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I, that's why I think when, when I said you're brave, I think that's what makes you brave is that this fearlessness of like, I can put it out there and I'm not really worried about it. You know, yeah, I just, I just don't care. Like, I don't, I care about being judged as a human in the as world, but not through my books. Like, not through I your care art. about it. And oh, she's she's wearing a really stupid outfit. Like, I care about it in all those ways that everybody does, but not th via the books. Like, not as the books as a portal to judgment about me. Wow, wow. I think that's kind. Of, I don't know if you know how profound that is to me. It really is. Yeah. I mean, because it just like, because that gives you so much freedom to write then. Yeah. I mean, I think, but you know, fiction is different from essays. Like I think with essays, you do feel like it's you, but with novels, you don't, or I don't. Yeah. But I guess it's, and I hadn't really, I didn't really know this term. It's, it's, it's auto nonfiction, which I guess is this th term I hadn't, I was not familiar with, but auto fiction, they call auto fiction. It, yeah. That's what I meant. Auto fiction. Yeah. And so, I like auto nonfiction though. I think that's that's how it should start to be called. Really? Yeah, just by my yeah, by my dumb stuff. Yeah, but it, when you call it auto itself, and that's you know, so yeah, I don't know. I I didn't give it that term. Like the crit critics give it that term, auto fiction, because but all writing is auto fiction. Like all right. writing comes from yourself. It's a really silly term, but yeah, I mean, they guess they use it for people that write characters that have their name, which right, again, like that's only in how should a person be? Does the character have my name? Right. Not on, none of the other books. So. Well, okay, but not, but, um, well, the but I know obviously the diaries and, but also, <laughs> but I also know that, you know, uh, uh, pure color was very, was taken from yeah. your life. I mean, I just, yeah, we know that, um, a lot of ways. but okay. So I also want to know, about this, um, and I know I'm concentrating on how should a person, well, on both of them, I guess, but this play that you were commissioned to write, mm -hmm. what is like, what is that? How does that work that you were tortured by throughout the whole book? Because uh, you felt like I, you, you couldn't write, come up with anything good. How does that come about? Like what, uh, so a local theater said, we write us a play? Yeah, yeah. And it I, was their, and there was their idea. 
Yeah, yeah. They commissioned a play for me. But they said, I, I mean, they said, this is what we want it to be about? Or they said, right about it, it was a feminist theater company. And they said it could be about anything as long as it was about women. They just okay. had women in it. And, and I really had the hardest time. I mean, I just, I wrote a play. I'm sure you experienced this in Hollywood. Like, And then there was a lot of notes. And yeah. in, in theater, we call it dramaturgy. And there was mm -hmm. like, I got so confused. And I just couldn't make the play better from the notes. And it was it was just this torture because when you're writing a book, or at least in my case, editors aren't mm -hmm. like that. They're not like giving you their notes to right. make the book something other than what you want it to be. But in theater, what's this character's motivation? Why does this happen here? Like there was just so much feedback and I just lost my sense of what I liked about it and what it was. And then how did you find it? Because ultimately you were happy with it, weren't you? Ultimately, I just like when it got put on a couple of years after How Should a Person Be was published, it was just my original draft. So I never, I never ended up editing it according to any of the notes in the end. Wow. So you won, you won that battle. I guess so. Uh, you I mean, did. It wasn't them who put it on. It was some other, some kid. Oh. I, I mean, he's not a kid anymore, but he was, he, he seemed like a kid at the time. But you also, yeah. But you also do something called Trampoline Hall, which struck me as really fun. It's, it seems like you're just part of this art world. You make art. It, well, I don't care what it is. Let's just do something weird and interesting. And so Trampoline Hall, which I love the premise of it, it's you say people deliver lectures on subjects they don't know anything about. Well, the, is the, that what it is? It's not their like, area of professional expertise. So they can do but, Oh, so they are experts. They, are. they can do research for the for the their talk it's just that it can't be their professional expertise so okay so they're not talking out of the rest they're talking about no. stuff they know oh, okay stuff that they do the research but yeah and then there's like so the talk lasts about 15 minutes and then there's a q a mm -hmm. and then so there's three of those a night and it, yeah it's been running like once a month in toronto since december 2000 or 2001 and i haven't produced been involved them? in it no, oh, no i mean i i started it with and my friend misha globerman is is and was the host but after about three or four years i left like around 2005 or so and he but he still keeps it going so now right. i used to pick the three people every month and like i just used to when i was in my 20s i had crushes on people all the time and it was fascinated by people in such a way that it was a way of like having these pro friendships where you know i would go out with them and talk about what their talk was going to be about and then i'd see them on stage and it was just a way of like being with people my life is not really like that anymore where I'm coming into contact with so many people that I just have to like have a show and put them on stage because I find them so fascinating. And right. the culture's changed, you know, because again, like in the early 2000s, there weren't, the internet wasn't what it is. And I just felt like there's all these smart people with all these interesting things to say and nobody's paying any attention to them. And like, here's a venue for them. Like you obviously don't need that, a barroom lecture series for people to have a voice in this culture. Anymore. Yeah, right. That's, that's right. So, and do you, because you might, because now you deal with students, young young people, and so, mm -hmm. what's your what's what's your take then as an artist as you you know deal with people of this younger generation? What do you see? I don't know. I mean, I I only see them through a very narrow lens. You know, like you don't show your teacher that much of your life. Like I see them sitting in a classroom for two and a half hours once a week. Uh -huh. I've only done it for but like you, seven weeks. But you read their work. Or you you pretend to. I read it. There's not that much. I mean, I I don't know. You can't really generalize about a generation. Like every every uh -huh. every person's different. I one of the stories in my book is really is about that. It's about I had a. It was about me trying to being in a creative writing class, trying to impress my teacher, and just having no idea how to write, just none, and feeling complete. You're la You're smiling because you can you can relate or you see it. Well, because I just I'm smiling because yeah, that's how people feel, and it's it's sort of a, a failure of the way that creative writing is taught that makes a person feel like they can't write. Well, okay, so what do you, so when you what's the first thing you tell your students? What's the most important thing you tell tell your students then? Maybe. Well, I try to show them all all these examples of like so called bad writing, you know, like because and and stuff that's that's intentionally boring and that's badly put together because I just think. That's it's a better route. You're more likely to become a good writer if you're trying to do something bad than if you're trying to do something good. If you're reading like the greatest writers and you're trying to emulate them and you're all intimidated and blocked mm -hmm. and nervous and 
you're trying to write in a style that has nothing to do with yourself. Right. But so then what, how does showing them something bad help? Do you say like, go ahead and write or write? What, what, what's the, what's the point of showing them something bad? Because I don't want them to try to write well. You don't, but you don't want them to write like schlocky, like, or poorly written stuff either. I'd rather have them write like basic. I I don't know. I just think when you're trying to impress, when you're writing to try to impress somebody, it's just, you're, you're starting off on completely the wrong foot. So I want them to like, I want them, they're writing. So for example, in this class, one of the first experiments we did was like, I told them to go into their messages, their text messages, threads, and to copy out every single text message that they'd sent, you know, and, and put that in a document and make it a long sort of monologue Uh because that is actually what they write. That is what they're writing. Like you got to start from what you're actually saying and what you're actually writing, not this imaginary idea of what writing is. Right. 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 There's this, that's exactly right. So there's this thought of what writing should be and what writing, how do you get, I guess, how did you get over that? Especially when you were writing your favorite authors were the greats. Like, how did you, how did you find the confidence to have your own voice? I guess. Well, when I was young, I, I, when I was a teenager, I read um, all the Paris Review interviews, and uh-huh. I just, I just got the sense like, oh, there's no what, there's no way to do it. There's no one way. Like everyone has their own way. Like Faulkner has his way, and right. Dorothy Parker has her way, and John Cocteau has his way, and there's just no consensus, and so you just have to figure out your own way. Like that's what they all did. I just sort of saw that's what each one of them had done. See, that's that's where I struggled with. And you're you're gonna be my therapist now and my creative writing <laughs> teacher. When I was starting to write this book, because as a TV writer, my job is not to have a voice. My job is to emulate right. the voice of the show right. or the characters. And I'm a copy, I'm a mimic. That's what I do. And I can, you know, that's what I've been doing for 27 years. And then to write, this was an experiment to me. Well, how, what would it be like to write what just whatever I want to write with no notes, no one telling me what to do? And it was very scary in the beginning. And it was very I was inspired. I, I love David Sedaris. I went like, what, what's, how can I do him? And so I wrote a couple of pieces. I studied him. I read all, I've studied his books over and over again. He was so entertaining and writes so beautifully. Uh, yeah. And I wrote, read it over and over again. And I wrote my first pieces almost like I was doing him. And I felt, oh, this is good. And then I let it sit for a couple of weeks. And then I read it with fresh eyes and like, this is terrible. This right. sounds like someone pretending to be him. It's, it's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a stage that you still probably learned a bunch by doing that. Um, Maybe about that, structure or about something. No, no? not e- not that. I learned. I learned that I can't, that I felt like I was a pretender. But but my my thought was, well, he's doing it. He's successful because I, I write and I, now I perform my pieces as well, okay. which is what and I travel. I you know tour a little bit, okay. and I thought, well, if it works for him, wh- why reinvent the wheels? He's obviously got a market. And then I realized I had to come to the conclusion that it was almost heartbreaking. I can never, I can never write like him. I, I can't, no matter how much I want to, it'll never happen. Yeah. And then I had to let go of that. And then I had to come to the more, even larger heartbreaking realization was like, oh, I have to write like me. And who yeah. the hell is that? You know? And how did you find it? Uh, it was a lot of just drafts after draft, and and then the pro- the problem, and this is something else. What I find the er- some of the earlier pieces are very different from the later pieces, and I'm tempted to go back and change the earlier ones, but like you're saying, I'm also tempted. I feel like I can't. I can't. It's time to let them go. Right. That was that person. Yeah, but it's all in the same book, and that felt like, well, should there be any kind of? Is that okay? You know, is it okay to feel like each one's so a little different from the other? I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, are the early ones still good, even if they're different? I, yeah, I think they're good. I just think they're, I just think, I'm not sure if anyone else would notice except for me. That's what yeah, I noticed. Maybe not. Yeah, probably. It, it was, yeah, prob- and I think it's okay if they're a little different from each other. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, well, well, we'll find out. But um, But that was very difficult for me to figure out how to, and I was turned, I turned a lot to, and I wonder if you do this, like you kind of answered a little bit. I turned to me, I didn't want to turn to other writers. I wanted to turn to, I turned to musicians, to music. Do you do that as well? Which musicians? It was turning to musicians to find out what is art. What's the whole, what, what am I supposed to be doing here? Um, Yeah. 
And I, I was trying to look to painters for that. Into painter is it, you know, contemporary painters or, or contemporary who? or not contemporary. Nothing, and how do I you guess. pull that? How do you pull? Like, what are you looking for them? I, how, yeah. When you look at a painting, how, do, how does that help you? Well, how does it help you to look at musicians? Well, there's two things with music. And I, I feel like music is too, they're telling us, they get to tell a story with lyrics and with music. So, if, you know, so if you didn't hear the lyrics, maybe you, you'd still get the scent, the, the sentiment right. of it. And so I feel like they have two tools where we only have one because uh, they can set a mood just for the tune. Yeah. And so I, I look to them for the intimacy and their bravery. Like you look, like, okay, Stevie Nicks is she's singing about herself. That's all she's doing, you know. Yeah. And like, okay, you're you can do that. It just felt so vulnerable to be doing this. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's why I'm shocked that you know you're so brave about it. I mean, it's like the only, it's the only job is to like not yeah. care about how not care about yourself um in relation to it like your that the book matters and you don't matter that the book right that's your job is to put the art first right yeah to not to not not do things because you're worried about what people will think of you right right that's the first and i guess when i was younger i was reading so many avant-garde writers that that did that in, in such flamboyant ways. Like it just seemed to me the only like Henry Miller, you know, like it just seemed to me the first, maybe the first lesson, like not even a conscious lesson, just like, Oh, clearly he's not worried about what people are going to think of him or his reputation. Among right. Decent people. Yeah. Right. Right. And so you don't have that. Obviously you don't have that worry. No, but I don't know you, a lot of decent people. You, yes, you do. Um, but it's so, yeah, that's, I don't know. Like, again, it's it's what makes you I don't know such a fantastic writer. I mean, I really I, I want everyone to to read your to your work because it's uh, it's really fantastic. Um, yes. I have I have some questions here that I have to ask from so my so my daughter Lola, yeah. who's um uh, I, I right. tell her I tell her she's a she's a, a better way better writer than I was at her age. But the truth is, she may be a better writer than I am now. But I don't tell her that part. But she has these questions she had she put together some questions like damn you got some good questions so i can't Great. take i can't take credit okay i can't take credit for this question those questions um okay uh first of all she says what are your dreams for uh, what are your dreams for your writing and how do you let them go while also keeping them alive Oops, i dropped a rock my dreams <laughs> you dropped a rock yeah i dropped it i have a i have magic uh, uh crystals by my computer that uh, are supposed to make my work better Oh, what what kind of rock is that? I want one. It came out of my head. You want you you're, you want some? Uh, yeah, I don't know. They're magic, but you get, they're they're on my computer. So she's. What are your dreams for your writing, and how do you let let them go while also keeping them alive? And I guess what she means is what I guess ambitions. You know, because yeah, she's at the age you were talking about that young age. Yeah, I mean, you my when I was how old is she? Twenty. Yeah. When I was twenty, my dream was like to be the best living writer, like just to be the best novelist, just to work harder than any other writer alive. Like that's what I was thinking. It was work so harder. I was like, I got to work harder than any other writer alive. That's what and I what did that work look 20. like to you? Just always writing and like always not being satisfied and and being a real critic of my work and mm -hmm. trying to make it better and trying to be more, try to get it to sound more interesting and figure out what my sentences were and yeah. letting myself be bad and repeat myself until I got better. Like, so I don't, I don't think, um, and I don't think that I ever let that go. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sitting here today saying I work harder than any other writer alive, but I do remember having that, that, that feeling when I was young, like, that's what I need to do. That's the only way it's going to work. Yeah. That's that importance. Yeah. That, because a, it's just too it's just so hard it's just so hard to write well yeah to write anything good for people i think i think you give the perfect answer on that because i'll make well, i'll give her another the parental answer in any case work hard work hard well but it's, <laughs> but it was it really true just... like i think it's true that you know and i remember being her age and like interviewing this older canadian writer barbara gowdy who i really loved and and she told me and she's terrific she told me, you know, 
I was writing for the student newspaper and she said, um, you know, it's funny. There's, I've got my students who have talent, clear talent. And then I've got these other students who don't seem to have so much talent, but the ones who don't have so much talent work really hard and they end up doing better than the ones that have talent. And I thought, Oh, Oh, I never even would have known that. You really? know, I would have thought that I didn't know that hard work meant could mean more than talent. So hopefully and you have talent and then you can also make the choice. To have right. Hard work. And you learn this at a young age, you're saying this is the part. I mean, my mother was also just very strict about working hard. Right. School right. Studies and stuff, you know. Interesting. She, she, yeah. She's, she's a okay. She's a, she, she's a real deal. Hungarian. Well, Hungarian. Yeah. Do you speak any Hungarian? No. Do you? No. No, I don't. But I, I do know there's a Hungarian expression that uh, really helped me. I'll what? tell you what it is. So, so do you speak any other languages? No. 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 That's your next task. Because <laughs> yeah. there's, I was, um, I wrote about this in one of my stories as well. There's, an, there's a Hungarian expression where it says, uh, when, okay, so let me take it back. So I, I learned to speak Spanish as, as a teenager and then Italian as an adult. So and so each time when you learn a new language when you, that you're not born into, there's that moment where it's like it's really hard to talk. It, it takes months and months. And then finally, one day you open your mouth and the words just come out without thinking. Just like that, like magic. And it's like turning on a light bulb. And I've had a hard time explaining to people what that feels like. But then I discovered a Hungarian expression, which said it perfectly. It says, when you, when you learn a new language, you gain a new soul. And I oh, thought wow. that's exactly what it feels like. Because you're wow. talking, you're like, who is this? Pro I'm not, I don't speak this language. Who am I? That's you know? Incredible. Yeah. And that's like, uh, and you talk about soul so much in your work. I thought maybe, maybe that's something you had experienced. Yeah, I never with. got that far. I mean, I studied French and it never, I never got close to a new soul. Like I didn't have, because you're always translation. Because you're always yeah. translating in your head. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just that moment because you're like, I, I don't know who I am. And then you find yourself reacting yeah. differently and also using, if I find myself, I can't say, I don't know how to say this. So I'll say it this way, which is not how I would talk because I can't, that's how the only way I can express it. And then you're, you're a different person. That's so you know? neat. Yeah. No yeah. wonder people love learning languages. Yeah. It really is. Um, anyway, your mom must know. She, she came up with it. Um, okay. So let's give me, let me give you another question. Uh, okay. This is a good one. Okay, how do you toe the line between explaining what you mean by your writing, uh, for example, the entire tree portion of pure color, and just letting it be, even if that means being misinterpreted or, or confusing people? Like, how do you, how do you toe the I line between really explaining? Explain. I think I never really, I think I spend very little time explaining. But are you worried that it, it might be misinterpreted, you know? Like, you yeah. want people to understand your thoughts. Yes. Yeah, I guess so. I mean... I think it's, I think if the intention is there, if it's like a clear intention when you're writing, then you're maybe not going to be misinterpreted as much as you think. And the intention is something that you can't really analyze, you know, you can't take it apart, take a sentence apart and say where the intention was. But I do have that feeling that when writers are writing with a really strong intent, emotional or like, or not emotional, just that it's coming from something very powerful inside them, then it's less likely to be interpreted than, yeah, than one might fear. But I don't when think you, that I go in for much explaining. Well, when you when you share your work with a friend, do you do you say, hey, do you get what I'm going for here? I mean, I, I you know, <clears throat> when you share your work, then people say what they're getting from it. And usually it's not that, usually the problem <clears throat> I have is not that they're not getting what I, it's not that they're, I don't usually feel like the problem with people, with readers is misinterpretation. I think usually the problem is that it, it's not interesting. It's not compelling. It's not, um, rather than it's, they're getting something completely different from what you intended. Because see, in, in TV writing, we, I often think the difference between write, smart writing and maybe not smart writing is, is not that much. It's just like, whether you're explaining it or not. If you don't explain it, you're making the audience work and then they think oh this must be smart because i figured it out right right but and and like dumb writing <clears throat> you just don't you just say hey, you spell it <laughs> hey you spell it out but um but you don't that's not something that's your concern i guess 
I mean, I just don't want to ever, I think I've always, always never written the connective tissue that other writers put in. I just, I have this feeling like if I'm not interested in writing it, it probably doesn't need to be written. And, and maybe that's not true, but I always don't want to feel obliged to write something just for the reader. Like if right. I don't have a need to write it myself, then I don't think it should be on the page. Well, and that's why I think I'm not so good at writing nonfiction because oh. nonfiction is very much about serving the reader with explanation. Right. right. Well, but there's some moments where like, right. I, I tend to race through moments, which I shouldn't race through. So I, I'm conscious of that. It's like, uh, go back and write it and make sure it lands and take, this is not uh, a sentence. You better step it out, you know, with a paragraph or something, but do you, but you don't, that's not something that even, that's why I think you're more artful, you know, when you're writing. I don't know. I try to skip it. I just don't want to put something down on the page if it doesn't also have some need from myself to be written like I just don't want to write something just for the reader to just for the reader. get two parts to you know I had a friend I remember when we were much younger she was like how do you get people out of rooms I was like why do you need oh. to get them out of the room like but he felt like he had to put every step in right right and you'll just take a jump and yeah, yeah. Like, well, what if you don't feel like writing them leaving the room then just yeah just I think yeah yeah I, I, it was just such a different thing that I never thought like you don't yeah. have, the reader doesn't need to see them leave the room. It's right. like that with lots of things. Yeah, I agree with you. It's hard to know. I think I agree with your friend, though. It's hard to know what to put in, what to put out, how, how much yeah. handhold. Because I don't think you, I, I really feel like when reading you, I feel, I feel like you're pulling us through a trail. You're, taking, you're holding us by the hand, but you're walking ahead. And then sometimes you wait for us to catch up. And then you move ahead and then we're catching up to you, but then you stop and you wait for us. So I, I felt taken care of as a reader, That's you know? Nice. Yeah. But, but it turns out, turns out you didn't, you weren't, you weren't trying to take care of me at all. <laughs> <laughs> you were just writing the way you write. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, I wanted to make sense. Like I wanted mm. to make sense. Of course. It's just like, how much sense does a person need? But I'm also not, I don't also think that, well, everyone's going to like my books. Like I, I sort of take it as a given that probably half the people won't and that's okay. Like I'd rather have like a third of the people really, or a quarter of the people or a 10th of the people really love it, you know, uh -huh. and then the rest not really get it. So I don't think that I'm trying to write but the kind of books that, yeah. You did in one of your pieces, you, you did mention, I want to, that you felt compelled to write something with a little more commercial appeal. Right, at one um, point, in the diary, I said. Yeah, that. Uh, was it? Maybe might have been the diary. Yeah, I mean, I'm always trying. You know, when you're young, you're always trying to figure out like, how am I going to make money? Right, right. But, you, but also, like, you can't even. That's hard. Like, it's hard to write something with commercial appeal. It's not as easy as it sounds. Um. Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I. I don't know. I, to me. It's, writing something people think oh i'll just write like some dumb popular book but it's like those oh no that's, hard. that's something that people really want yeah that's true i agree with you there but i also feel like uh like like well, whatever like this is like next level like I, like I said i don't know where you begin to think that uh this is gonna you, this is gonna work and it does you know what i'm saying it's not like I, because it's so many things um but it all they all the pieces fit together especially at the end it, it, it all makes sense so it was just lovely. Oh yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, um, that made me want to throw the book across the room <laughs> because I can't do this. <laughs> Damn it! Um, but okay, uh, I want to answer another uh, one more question, and then I want to, uh, and then I, uh, and then uh, you know, then I'll let you go back to your life, but but not until I get my my answers. All um, right. uh, let's see, what was it? Um, okay, this is interesting. So. She writes so beautifully. She says, okay, you've, you've answered a question as daunting as how should a person be in a whole book in many ways, uh, in many different ways and explorations and explanations, you've arrived at answers, not explicitly or all at once, but sewn into the whole entire book. So she asks, what was your initial instinctual answer on how a person should be when that question first popped into your head? Gosh, I mean, honestly, Lola, I don't even remember. It was so uh -huh. long ago. Like that was like 20 years ago that I started writing that book. I think that, I don't think that I even was thinking about like, oh, what's my answer? I just really liked the way that sentence sounded. And like, I came but up with But you were trying sentence. to find yourself. 
at that point. Yeah, but that sentence also was such a weird sentence. I don't even remember, like, I remember <clears throat> feeling, I had it on my wall, like I wrote it down and I put it on my wall because I was thinking about it, should this be the, you know, I don't know, that's an important sentence for me. I didn't know it was going to be the title of the book or anything. And my friend Margo mm-hmm. came in, I was at a writer's retreat, this place called Yaddo, and she came in and she's like, that, she visited me there. She's like, that should be the title of your book. But I remember I put it on the wall because to me, it was such a weird sentence. Like, you know, it just like got in my head like a, earworm like it just like a bug like mm. what w- w- is this sentence even asking a question like is this sentence even saying something like I I liked you know and I remember I I put you know when I was at this writer's colony I, I wasn't sure the title of the book should be should it be how should a person be should it be the ugly painting competition I had one or two other ideas and there was this table that writers could sort of put notes for each other on. And I, I put this note on sort of saying like, make a tick mark with which title you think it should be. And most people chose the ugly painting competition. So there's this like retrospective thing right. where like, Oh, that's like, that's a really good title people say, but you know, at, I think at the time it was, it just felt like a really weird sentence. And so I didn't really have an instinctive answer. I more just had like a magnetic attraction to that sentence so you weren't struggling with this with the with the notion at, at the time of how you should be because it really i felt like you were when i was reading it i mean you have to like narrow things down to put them in a book i mean i was just lost and confused and didn't know how to be a good person and i didn't know what choices i should be making or how anybody made choices or yeah like it, it all comes together in that sentence i guess but I wasn't walking around like as a human thinking, how should a person be right for myself? I was just like making really, I was just feeling very um, discouraged and very excited alternately. Right. Oh, okay. It's so, okay. So, all right. Yeah. That's the, that's the hard part being asked a question from a book that was so, so long ago, but I would tell it. But I think that's the right answer. Like, I think that you're, as you're, you're, you're not really magnetized exactly by the questions that are your life questions. You're magnetized by the questions that can be translated into book questions. Uh, go on. I'm like, almost there. I'm almost with you. <laughs> I'm still like struggling. You're, you're, you're drawn to the, you can't, you have to narrow things down to put them in, a book you can't put your whole life into a book like you have to narrow it down right and so you become attracted to those symbols like the sentence how should a person be is like a symbol like you become attracted to these symbols that can that can be objects in a book but in your life you're not living symbolically where you're just lost and you just don't know how to be you know but so it doesn't like crystallize in life. It's just this miasma of like confusion and doubt and whatever. That's what life is. So do you think your writing helps you make sense of your life or are you making sense of it first and then writing? Am I making sense of it first and then writing? No. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying or no? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think you're writing to to try to give structure to it, to right. try to give narrative, to to try to give like color to it or like shaded shade and yeah, no, I don't think, you know, you don't, don't make sense of it first and then write it out. Right. You know? And so in that way, I agree with you. And, and in that way, you almost invent yourself. You go, okay, yeah. this is a narrative. And, and now I guess it's true now, you know? Well, no, and no, because it's not that it's true now because you know that you invented it. So it's like, it serves a purpose for a, a, a short period of time. It serves a purpose. Yeah. But you yeah. know, you invented it. So it doesn't really permanently serve a purpose. But it, it does help you understand it does help you, like I said, make a narrative of your life, and that helps you understand. Oh, this is who I guess this is who I am now. This is what this is who I am. Right? For those three years that you're For writing, three years. and then the book ends, and then you're lost again, and then you're like, now who am I going to be? What am I going to be? Like, what is my outline? And then how do you come? Okay, so how do you decide what your next work is going to be? I mean, you can make all sorts of decisions, and then like like we started off the conversation, then right. three weeks later it was the you realized you were wrong so it's more just like what sticks around right again like you're i see you're wearing a wedding ring like you're married like you know that it's like a your partner you you probably had other people you thought you might marry or whatever but it's just like who ended up being your wife like you can ask that question retrospectively but at the time like you hope she's going to be your wife right maybe you hope this other person was going to be your wife you don't really know what it's going to be 
So right. I guess it's the same with, with a book project. Like retrospectively, you're like, oh, well, geez, I'm still working on that. It's been four years. Isn't isn't that interesting though? Even when you talk about that, that you're, it's almost like, it's almost, it's like how you're, when you talk about marrying someone, it's just more, it's like, it's not even so much the person, it's the time. <laughs> it's the right. time when, you know, it's almost like timing, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's probably yeah. part of it too. Like you always, I always want to start a book and and then when I actually do start one, I'm like, oh, well, you just weren't ready yet. You were still like, still attached to the last book or. But do you feel, okay, I get this idea of what sticks is what you'll, what you'll work on and what, what you know, has the legs, for. but do you feel any kind of pressure to, I don't know, to continue reinventing? Cause this is what you're doing. Like I, that's what I, that's the pattern I see. Oh, I'm reinventing what my writing will be. I, mean, I don't feel pressure. I feel like excited Excitement. or the curious. I'm curious, like, or I would just want like, well, what's the next thing? No, it's not pressure. It's more just looking forward okay. to something new to play with. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. I get that. I understand that to me, I would be thinking, well, it's, if it ain't broke, why am I trying to fix it? What, like this is to <laughs> keep exploring. I don't know, but, uh, but um, no, I get but you it. Did, that, that's not true because you did leave screenwriting. Well, I'm still kind of. I'm, 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 but, who but knows? You started who something knows? new. Yeah, and it wasn't broke. It was just that you wanted to try something. Yeah, it different. really was. It really was. Kind of, what you know? Uh, what would I? Yeah, what can I do without someone telling me what to do? Yeah, you know. But did you have any? Did you ever have any interest in writing for screen? I've tried, and I just don't have the. I mean, I, 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 I would have to put in a lot more time than I probably have, but. The couple of times I've tried to write for the screen, I just felt like it didn't. Yeah. It's just yeah. not my medium. It's a right. very different. It's a much more mathematical, yeah. dramatic, logical kind of, I don't know. Do, and you, but, you know, it's only halfway there because then the actors have to come. I right. just like the, the, I like the fact with the book that it's, it's, all, it's the whole thing. It's all yours. You're right. Do you watch a lot of TV or film? Yeah. My, my boyfriend and I watch something more or less every night. Oh really? What what are yeah, you into? He loves movies. Um, what right now we're watching The Boys. Oh, The Boys. Okay, right. But I think my favorite was The Leftovers. The left. Wait, I didn't see that. That's Leftovers. a TV show that ran for three seasons. I thought that was like an incredible work of art. Really? I'm not yeah. For that. The Interesting. Leftovers is great. But yeah, I love. I mean, and I love like Curb and Seinfeld. I mean, just right. this good old TV. Good old great TV. TV. Wow. Sheila, Sheila Hetty, thank you so much. I, I don't know. I, this, this is why, this is one of the benefits of getting to do what I'm doing now is I get to meet people like you and just learn uh, and soak it up. Cause I just feel you're is such an incredible talent. And so I urge everybody just to, uh, what, what, I don't know, your newest book will be alphabetical diaries. That's February drops in February, but um, I don't, and I guess for me, I'll probably read motherhood next. Is that what I should read next? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> She's shaking her head. Okay. <laughs> That's what I will. And so I urge everyone, Sheila, thank you so much. Thank you so Thanks much so for much joining me. Thanks so much for this interview. Thanks for oh, asking me. I really this was such a pleasure. It. Oh, please. This Thanks is, this is a, I, everyone in my family, I was telling everybody, look, I get that interview, Sheila Hetty. And, like, you know, <laughs> it was like a big deal. You know, I got my questions. My daughter sent me <laughs> questions. Don't ruin it. Don't ruin the opportunity. For, thank you again so much. All thank right, everyone. So more uh, great stuff uh, next week. Thank you so much for listening uh, and keep writing. So now we all know what the hell Michael Jammin's talking about. If you're interested in learning more about writing, make sure you register for my free monthly webinars at michaeljammin.com slash webinar. And if you found this podcast helpful or entertaining, please share it with a friend and consider leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. That really, really helps. For more of this, whatever the hell this is, follow Michael Jammin on social media at Michael Jammin Writer. And you can follow Phil Hudson on social media at Phil A. Hudson. This podcast was produced by Phil Hudson. It was edited by Dallas Crane. And music was composed by Anthony Rizzo. And remember... You can have excuses or you can have a creative life, but you can't have both. See you next week.